Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar on innovation in retail banking. I'm, organized I'm, by the Asian I'm Banker. Growing your on Growing Your RMB Business by the Asian Banker. We will now start the session and I will hand you over to the session's moderator, Peter Helfick, Managing Editor of the Asian Bankers Editorial Division. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Rati. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody to this teleconsultation, which we created as a dialogue on growing your RMB business with leading practitioners, including, of course, um, SWIFT and uh, Standard Chartered Bank and HSBC. Uh, the RMB is a source of endless fascination from China watchers and financial industry experts alike, representing, as it does, a key component of global political development, as well as one of the few recent sources of true in innovation, coming as it does at a time when we are reversing our attitudes towards innovation in other areas of financial services, as we are all aware. Um, uh, the RMB, of course, um, has been the story to watch for the past three years, but now somehow uh, coming to a crossroads where it's gaining some type of traction. It's not at critical mass yet, but we do expect it to be there in the time, uh, in, uh, in due course, of course, uh, as uh, China modernizes its financial services industry and uh, becomes a truly global player. Um, vault, it's vaulted, of course, to be the second largest economy in the world, and in due course, it'll be the, the largest. Um, China is, of course, as well, the country that uh, invented money in the first place, paper money, uh, having been in China for over a thousand years. So it's probably taking its rightful place. When, however, it uh, becomes a true international currency uh, is uh, still up to the regulators, of course. But in the meantime, we can understand what we uh, can expect for it to go forward. Um, to help break down these issues, we have with us today um, three experts uh, who will be giving presentations. Uh, one is from SWIFT, which is in a unique uh, position to gather data on remedy payment trends in its role as the industry's main payment infrastructure, um, managing as it does approximately 80 to 90 percent of international payments from major banks. Uh, we also have two banks that seem to have the leading edge in terms of the remedy strategies through their long histories in China and Hong Kong, HSBC and Standard Chartered Bank. You may already be familiar with all or some of our speakers today, uh, so I will only give brief introductions so that we can get started. Wim Raymakers manages SWIFT's banking markets worldwide, where he is responsible for identifying new trends in correspondent banking. Wim has extensive experience in corporate cash management, connectivity channels, and e-commerce. Michael Rontamitis, uh, who will be our first speaker today, is the regional head of project management, pro sorry, product management for Northeast Asia for Standard Chartered Bank, where he has product oversight for cash management and trade finance solutions. Uh, Thomas Poon is the head of uh, Business Planning and Strategy for HSBC Bank in Hong Kong, which we know, of course, is currently the only uh, offshore center for RMB settlement. Uh, and there he strategizes and promotes the bank's RMB business initiative. As for the structure of the webinar, uh, Michael will set the scene with some background on the RMB and Hong Kong as its main offshore center. Wim will give a perspective on business opportunities as shown by transaction data, while Thomas will contextualize strategic terms. Um, before we start, I want to highlight some of the house rules and uh, uh, introduce you as well to um, some of the follow-up. Uh, the link to the teleconsultation has been sent to all of you so you can log in from your computer to follow the presentation on your screen while the presenter is going through the slides. We are taking a recording of the session as well, which will be made available on our website later. To submit a question, uh, please press the hand button below the list of attendees in the chat room on your screen. This will register your interest with the host and you'll be able to type your questions into the chat bar you see on your screen. Questions will be read out in the Q&A session that will come at the end uh, of our web, web, uh, teleconsultation session after the three presentations. Uh, attendees have no access to your details such as the name of your organization, etc. Uh, so please uh, feel free to be... Uh, to disclose as, as much information and to ask uh, any type of question that you'd like. Um, without any further ado, I'd now like to hand it uh, over to Michael, who will speak ten min uh, for about 10 minutes on the context of the RMB. Michael, please. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Peter, um, and uh, a warm welcome. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk and set a little bit of context around um, the RMB and its, um, its origins, and then talk through some of the uh, latest status and then just finish off on uh, some of the automation um, issues that we're seeing in the industry. Um, first of all, if I can just talk about a rapidly involving um, uh, currency 
Um, this started out in the um, in the late 90s in, the, in terms of border trade between uh, China and the neighbors and its neighbors, and um, and then in 2003, post the SARS crisis in Hong Kong, we saw uh, the renminbi being um, opened up and the renminbi seen uh, renminbi um, uh, real-time gross settlement system set up in Hong Kong with a clearing bank to settle effectively tourism receipts um, uh, for from visitors coming into to to Hong Kong from China. Um, back in uh, 2008, um, there was talk of uh, further liberalization, and sure enough, in July 2009, we saw the initial liberal signs of li liberalization with uh, 300 um, companies um, uh, in amongst five um, pilot cities. Um, and in, in 2009, we saw 0.1% of China's trade and redenominate to renminbi, uh, with an offshore liquidity pool in July 2009 of 54 billion. Um, this rapidly evolved, and, and the numbers on the slide show that you know in 2010 we saw 67,000 um, enterprises being in, in, involved in the scheme, 21 provinces, 5% of China's trade, and the deposit pool in, in Hong Kong grew to 315 billion yuan. In 2011, the first half, we've seen continued um, rapid expansion, 31 provinces, 10% uh, of China's trade, and the, the deposit pool has basically doubled in the last 12 months. If I go on to slide two, um, there was a recent visit by the um, by the uh, by the strong dele a strong um, central government delegation led by the vice premier Li Keqiang. Um, this is an important signal not only for Hong Kong as the offshore renminbi center, but also as the um, for the renminbi as a currency uh, for cross-border trade. Uh, the senior delegation reaffirmed Hong Kong's status um, as the Remembi Offshore Center. It talked about Hong Kong being uh, having uh, f excellent first mover advantage. Um, it talked about uh, various developments uh, of the offshore li Remembi liquidity pool, which we all know is very critical to um, the uh, emergence of the Remembi as an international currency. And it also opened up further repatriation channels back into mainland China. Um, the policies included. Um, the, uh, the, the, the expansion of the scheme from 20 provinces to 31 provinces in mainland China, taking, out of, taking it out of pilot stage into mainstream, uh, enhancing renminbi repatriation channels by including renminbi foreign direct investment by Hong Kong corporate entities to the mainland, and also the long-anticipated renminbi QFI scheme, otherwise known as mini QFI in the industry. Um, we saw expansion of the dim sum bond market by allowing domestic mainland corporates to issue renminbi bonds in Hong Kong, and an encouragement of, to mainland corporates to issue IPOs in Hong Kong denominated renminbi. We also saw uh, the expansion of investment quotas to central banks, the renminbi clearing bank, and renminbi participating banks in the mainland interbank bond market. Finally, we saw the launch of exchange trade, traded funds for, of Hong Kong equities in mainland China, further uh, linking Hong Kong and China closer together in this journey. All these are very, very positive developments and have wider implications beyond Hong Kong. One of the challenges as we um, as we um, as we move uh, as renminbi moves as an, becomes an international currency is this um, is this sort of move is this uh, offshore and onshore pool of liquidity. And if I could just have the next slide, which shows this uh, this question that a lot of people have around CNH versus CNY. Um, CNH is not a currency, um, and it's very important that um, that uh, people understand that CNY is the only is the only um, currency, it's the only recognised ISO currency. There is a different uh, onshore and offshore pool of liquidity, and need to differentiate. Uh, CNY and internal systems uh, and between counterparties because dealing in the offshore market and dealing in the offshore uh, onshore market have different rules and regulations, different liquidity constraints, uh, exchange rates and interest rates. Um, so there are, and there are specific um, eligibility rules for onshore CNY FX trade. Um, to deal with these complex scenarios um, and potential um, multiple correspondent intermediary banks, um, sending serial payments through the system. Uh, a group was formed in Hong Kong, uh, facilitated by SWIFT, uh, with 70 representatives from 24 institutions 
across various business segments of various business segments of financial institutions to to discuss the issue and come up with some recommendations. Uh, the groups met between April and June, um, and have defined this uh, this practice guide, which is still in. Um, in, um, in circulation uh, and in terms of getting uh, feedback, um, and hopefully will be published shortly. Um, but we defined some best practice around the use of um, Swift MT messages and ISO uh, 15022 messages for the for offshore CNY transactions. The guidelines covered mes multiple message types: uh, payments, the MT1 and 2 series, treasury payments, MT3 series, securities payments, and 5 series. Uh, standing settlement instructions for treasury and payments in the 6 series and obviously cash reporting in the 9 series. We have recommended the use of code words and structured code um, which is optional uh, for participants to, to adopt. And it's really around the, the usage of, um, of place of settlement and, and sort of a slash PSET slash country code to specify the place of FX settlement on transactions and reporting. Uh, there are specific identifiers around uh, trade settlement or non-trade settlement. Uh, we're using the, the code words of slash TR and slash NR um, to to identify um, to identify the, um, the, the the type of transaction so that can, the appropriate exchange rate can be allocated um, and to enable um, uh, straight through processing. Uh, we've also included additional information such as the uh, slash SPRO slash PVP in front of the structure code of um, the, the, the place of settlement to indicate the settlement mechanism of payment versus payment. These are early stages and we're trying to deal with some of the challenges that are coming through um, um, the, in terms of the offshore market, um, and uh, you know, I do uh, encourage participants to to download the uh, to download the uh, the best practice guidelines and uh, provide us feedback. With that, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much and pass on to um, to Vim. Uh, okay, thank you, Michael, for uh, giving us that uh, introduction. And um, if anybody has any questions for Michael, uh, especially around the challenges that he's sort of noted, um, you know, managing. Uh, a dual currency code where by rights only one currency exists, um, please uh, type them in uh, and we'll raise them during the Q&A session. And so now I'd like to move on to Wim's presentation on the Swift RMB data, which will last for about 20 minutes. Uh, Wim? Thank you, Peter. Um, and following up on uh, what Michael said, I would like to now share with you some insights that we could see, um, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, <clears throat> that we could see from the uh, RMB transactions going over the global SWIFT network. Uh, and indeed, uh, um, China is actually the biggest international corridor over SWIFT when looking at payments worldwide. Um, the US is, is kind of a center of a lot of the international transactions, but the uh, route and corridor to China is the biggest international payments corridor. If we look a little bit closer on the next slide, uh, in terms of how that uh, represents in terms of world currencies, we see, looking at the top 20 currencies, that the uh, CNY or Renminbi Chinese currency uh, actually took a quite incredible growth from October last year, when it was world currency in payments number 35, to June this year, where it was already uh, currency number 21. And the latest numbers that we have from September show that the CNY is now the 15th world currency, as we observe from uh, traffic data. So these are real transactions going um, across the world in CNY. Uh, overtaking the New Zealand dollar, the South African rand, uh, and, and so on. Uh, two observations maybe on this chart is that on one hand, the blue line indeed shows the payments in value, and we see that CNY in world value for payments is barely um, 1% in, in world payments. But we do see that the trade that China represents, which is the orange bar, is almost 10%. Uh, so you can look at it this two ways. Is one, yes, the CNY is moving up very rapidly. On one hand, going to a world currency number 10, probably uh, very soon. Um, but on the other hand, you see the potential as well 
in terms of um, the, the, the representation of the currency with relation to China's trade, which is about 10%. So I think that's a very, um, very positive message here in terms of the CNY, um, as Michael already pointed out in his numbers, taking a very strong growth. Looking uh, a little bit closer on the next slide at how that evolves, we see uh, also another good measure to see uh, and, and take a measure of internationalization and international usage of the currency by looking at the FX transactions in that currency. And we saw that in June uh, of this year, uh, CNY represented 0.9% in terms of FX confirmations most of it against the US dollar. Um, but again, putting that into relation to China's GDP share in the world of about 9.5%, we come to a factor of 9% FX versus GDP, which is very low, even compared to the Thai baht, which is also a relatively restricted uh, currency. But in relation to the smaller size of the Thai economy, we come to a factor of 46%. So even uh, for the Thai baht, much better than for CNY. So still, uh, I think, a long way to go for CNY to become, and we do see a, a tremendous increase, but there's still a long way to go for the CNY to actually become uh, an, an important trading currency in relation to the size of China's GDP. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, Peter. Yes, so in, in, in relation to that, we developed uh, a white paper together with HSBC and Standard Chartered who are on the call and four other banks um, where we looked at what does that mean in terms of implications for financial institutions. Uh, and I will just go very quickly over this heat map uh, that we developed to try and illustrate what the impact could be on financial institutions. Uh, looking at uh, from green, which is positive, to orange, which is slightly more um, impactful on banks' revenues, um, the bubble number one on the middle right shows that banks are offering uh, account servicing and liquidity reporting services to banks who open accounts uh, in China and Hong Kong to actually provide uh, corporate settlement services. So that is a positive uh, revenue pool and uh, service for those banks offering those services. And we do see also on SWIFT an increase in liquidity reports following those accounts opening. When we look at bubble number two in terms of trade settlements on the left upper uh, quadrant, um, there is quite a bit of redenomination in terms of when it comes to trade settlement. You know, the same corporate, the same payment of yesterday to the same corporate in China, but now they're paying in RMB instead of US dollar. So that is a redenomination. Uh, so not new business as such for the financial industry. There might be shifts in revenues for banks who have an RMB capability versus those that don't. But all in all, for the financial industry, this is well, maybe not a zero-sum game, but it doesn't really add new payments. This is the same payment that was there before. There is a positive outlook there in terms of companies being able to use CNY to do business with more corporates in China, so that could increase trade overall. So that does have a positive effect. And coming back to FX, which is the bubble 3A in the bottom middle, uh, we already hear from banks in China that they are seeing their revenues from FX decrease as corporates in China can use CNY directly rather than having to obtain or convert foreign currency. On the other hand, so that's a loss for the Chinese banks in terms of FX from corporate trade settlement. On the other hand, uh, as CNY gets more and more widespread with corporates abroad, those corporates need to convert FX and need some hedging options so there is a positive effect for those foreign corporates and the banks servicing those corporates. And we see the bubble 3B, the FX trading, as a very big opportunity. As pointed out, it's barely 1% in FX world trade. If that goes to 5% by 2020, that represents, we believe, a big opportunity for financial institutions to provide FX trading. Um, maybe some speculation there as well. But 
in terms of X FX trading in currency, this is a very big opportunity for banks to play on. When it comes to trade finance, the bubble number four at the bottom left, uh, there is already significant trade value uh, for structured trade finance products, letters of credits and documentary guarantees going on today. The RMB is the third most used currency in value for structured trade today. However, we believe that some of that is also redenomination, the same underlying trade, but now in RMB. And we believe that commodities uh, like crude oil, uh, for instance, will continue to require um, elaborate uh, structured trade finance constructs. Those commodities will continue to be settled in US dollar. And the last one, bubble number five, um, Michael, again, already alluded to that in terms of bonds, equities, trading, um, IPOs, uh, QFI, mini QFI. Every week there is a new policy liberalization when it comes to investment options in terms of securities services. We see a lot of product innovation, particularly in the Hong Kong market by financial institutions. And we believe that the security services um, as we will see more policy liberalization, as there is more RMB help outside of China, people want to get a return over and above the uh, anticipated appreciation. They want more returns on their investments, and we will see this going forward as the significant new business opportunity. Now, if we have a look at the next slide, how how does that actually uh, show up in terms of RMB transactions over time? Uh, we do see, going back from October 2010, a significant increase in RMB transactions over the last couple of months, um, leading uh, up to second quarter, March, April, we saw a significant increase in value. As you can see, August was a peak. Uh, September was a little bit less than August, but that is in line and actually a little bit better than uh, other currencies worldwide. We see a dip in value for September on worldwide numbers, so this is just a seasonal fluctuation. But overall, transactions from October to September increased by 1,300%. So that is very significant. Uh, and we see about 82% of that being processed in and out of Hong Kong. Five uh, roughly percent by China, and I think more interestingly, uh, 13 percent, which is growing, uh, by countries uh, other than China and Hong Kong. And to show, to dig a little bit deeper into that and show you even more details on the next slide, you see uh, the corridors of the countries involved in RMB transactions. Uh, you see, of course, Hong Kong, 81, 82 percent, depending on the month. Uh, you see the big bubble there. Uh, that's, of course, the clearing and that takes place in RMB in Hong Kong. Uh, we see significant uh, traffic volumes from the Middle East and Africa and Europe into Hong Kong from countries like the UK, uh, but also Spain, Italy, the Netherlands are starting to develop very significantly. And from Asia Pacific uh, with Hong Kong, notably Singapore. Interesting to note as well is those transactions that do not touch Hong Kong nor China, which uh, you could label as truly offshore transactions. Uh, and that is about 8% for the month of June, 9%, 10%, it kind of varies uh, on the month. But I think that's another testimony to the increased internationalization of the renminbi when it is actually used, for instance, between UK and Singapore. Uh, directly, so not involving China and Hong Kong, I think is another testimony to the international development of the renminbi being used by those two countries, for instance. So on the next slide, we would like to take this a little bit further uh, and show you the traffic evolutions, uh, one in terms of number of countries, uh, there's great interest within ASEAN countries, of course, that was one of the first liberalizations of the renminbi by the Chinese uh, policy makers. 
uh, we do see very active um, transactions coming out of Malaysia and Singapore really picking up in number of transactions. And we'll share with you the value of those transactions in the next slide. Asia Pacific, um, we do see activity from South Korea and from Japan. And here you see it in transaction value. Uh, I think this chart is really revealing. We cannot share the actual scale in the public information, but we can share that with financial institutions on an individual basis. But all of these charts are on the same scale. And you see that in terms of transaction value, Singapore really developing uh, since the beginning of this year, tremendous increase in transaction value from Singapore and into Singapore. Asia Pacific, uh, I think beyond ASEAN countries, we still need to see uh, significant development there, but we do see significant and important transaction value starting to build up from Japan. Of course, a large trading partner for China. And I think what I hear from feedback as well as to institutions that have been to Japan recently, there are very positive developments from uh, Japan in terms of RMB transactions, a lot of inquiries, a lot of new developments, and indeed we start already to see actual transactions starting to increase with Japan. In Europe, uh, the major country, as you can see in the chart, the blue line uh, growing up over time, almost overtaking uh, Singapore in some months, is the United Kingdom, very significant transaction value, probably also for institutional payments or effects-related payments. And we do see some interesting countries coming up as well, like France and Spain and the Netherlands. And in the Americas, you see the blue line for the United States also starting to develop, although be a bit slower, but of course that is a huge trading partner for China. Um, as we saw on the first slide, that is the biggest international payments corridor. And if co corporates in the Americas and banks in the Americas start to put their volumes in RMB, as we can see the build up there, that will be a significant development. And that's what we would like to show in the next slide, is how does this evolve on a country per country basis? And, you know, deeper and deeper drilling down into what are some of the opportunities that you could look at to develop your RMB business. This is a graphical illustration on a country per country basis of the graphs that I just shared with you. And you can see that the United States has taken off a little bit from the dotted line, which is the 0%, where it was about a couple of months ago. It is now 1% or 2% in terms of RMB payments, but still rather slow in terms of the horizontal chart showing the number of payments in RMB. And on the vertical axis, the, the higher you are vertically, the more important you are as a trading partner. And the size of the bubble shows how many payments there are between that country and China and Hong Kong. So you see Japan, for instance, was in June rather low in terms of using RMB with Hong Kong and China. The debt in September moved to the right to a quite significant number now for 5%, still low, but a significant shift to the right. Whereas we see Germany a little bit lower on the left still, we don't see Germany move for the moment. No significant RMB payment volume built up there. Uh, we do see Taiwan now indeed starting to have RMB transactions. And further at the bottom, if you uh, look at the bottom of the slide, uh, Canada developing from the left to the right, the orange bottle there. Uh, France also very significant new developments. Spain coming from almost nowhere in the last couple of months, uh, now all of a sudden appeared in terms of significant transaction volumes. And then uh, moving on further to the right, we see the UK, of course, which is now from the light blue bubble to the orange bubble, um, now having almost like 10% of uh, all payments with Hong Kong China in renminbi. And of course, uh, looking at the right, of the slide, Singapore, uh, now a very significant shift in volumes from the light blue to the orange bubble on the bottom right. 
Singapore now over 20% of all payments with Hong Kong China in uh, Renminbi. Significant developments here happening here. We also see, uh, going back to the middle, just under the UK, uh, the United Arab Emirates, quite interesting developments in the Middle East as well in terms of Renminbi business. Uh, we understand from talking to banks that this is for uh, construction works happening in the Middle East being paid in Renminbi. So that might evolve and fluctuate with those uh, those projects, but also there we see significant developments in and out of uh, United Arab Emirates and also Qatar, whereas from Saudi Arabia, which is probably more commodities and oil related, we do not see significant RMB developments for the moment. So actually, um, I hope in the next slide I would just like to summarize um, what I have said and I hope I've shared with you some of the more deeper insights from the traffic development. Uh, there are two uh, documents available from SWIFT. Uh, one is to better understand the implications. Uh, that is the white paper developed, as I mentioned, with um, Standard Chartered, uh, Michael, who spoke already, and with Thomas Poon from HSBC, who will be the next speaker, and four banks, uh, Bank of China, City, Deutsche, and ICBC. Uh, that white paper uh, goes uh, much further into explaining the implications, the heat map that I talked about earlier on. It's available from Swift.com, and all of the charts and the graphs and the data and the corridors uh, we can also share with you in this insights report that's available as well for financial institutions. And, and of course, there's much more details in uh, both of those reports. But I hope I was already able to share with you some deeper insights as to what are the implications and the opportunities for you to develop your RMB business. And with that, I would actually like to turn over to uh, Thomas to take it uh, to what is next and uh, what should you be doing following this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wim, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to just uh, remind people, we've had some questions come in, but I want to sort of uh, reiterate that uh, anybody who would like to, to uh, ask a question, please type it in through the chat panel that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also send us uh, your um, non-Q&A uh, type messages if you're have, experiencing any difficulties. All right, uh, now let's uh, proceed with Thomas Poon's uh, presentation. He'll be speaking for about 10 minutes on uh, the strategic context for the RMB. Uh, Thomas, please. Okay. Th thank you, Peter. Um, I, my, Michael already alluded to a number of relaxations announced by Vice Premier Lee's visit to Hong Kong uh, back in middle of August. This will surely help ensure RMB internationalization is on the right track. And then WIM's heat map also serves as a good reference point. But at the end of the day, what does it really mean to us in the, in the banking industry? On this slide, I try to put some number by looking at uh, our own crystal ball in terms of both uh, the RMB trade settlement volume that's between China and the rest of the world, and then uh, the RMB deposits, the RMB offshore bonds, and the RMB stock market size, uh, these three items are related more to Hong Kong only. Um, at, at the end of the day, I, I, I think it, it is probably apparent that um, China is too big an economic footprint to, to ignore, and, and as a result, uh, as they continue to internationalize RMB, that the fact that there's, there are going to be more uh, trades between uh, emerging markets and there will be more uh, uh, benefits to be derived from settling, so from settling the trade in RMB. We, we see tremendous potential in terms of uh, the, the growth of, of the RMB business here, and possibly not just in Hong Kong, but in other major uh, trading centers such as Singapore and, and London. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, which uh, basically outline uh, the, the, the sort of business opportunities uh, available to, to banks. This is probably another way of looking at WIMS uh, hit map. Um, can, can we turn to the next slide, please? Uh, 
Hello, Peter. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the the nature of this slide is pretty uh, self-explanatory. I, I I really try to to map the various opportunities uh, to to the customer list uh, within the different customer segments. I think the the key message of, of the slide is. Uh, we in the banking industry have to make a conscious decision in terms of how we should focus our resources uh, in, in these key strategic imperatives. Uh, I've been told time and again uh, with, um, with, um, internally and externally that RMB business opportunities at the moment appear somewhat a, a tantalizing uh, a proposition. Uh, it looks to be very promising, but, but near term, uh, it, it's still very restricted to, to Hong Kong, for example, and, and even in the case of Hong Kong, how profitable this uh, RMB business really is. So, so basically, um, the way that I, I, I try to think of the various issues that we need to address in terms of mapping out or strategizing our, our RMB proposition is just look at the, 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 the requirements of the customers, what that would translate into business opportunities uh, within the different customer segments. Uh, again, um, I think in terms of the value to be derived from this RMB business, uh, it, could, it could mean different things to different financial institutions in different parts of the world. It could be defined in terms of the league table position, the market share, uh, the brand, or even uh, the, the, the bottom line profit. Uh, but I think the, the most important thing is really to focus on uh, the, the, the strength of the business, what you think you are good at in, in terms of serving your customer needs uh, during the course of, of the RMB internationalization, and then the nature of the customer base and, and the location. Uh, I guess for, for banks, for a lot of African banks, uh, providing uh, RMB trade settlement potentially could be a huge opportunity given China's strategic interest in uh, a lot of commodity stuff in, in South Africa and the growing and the growing trade between African continent and, and China. So uh, with, with that in mind, hopefully uh, it will help us to, to focus or to, to, to focus our, our mind in terms of making the right decision on, for example, the risk management and control in respect of exchange, liquidity, regulatory, and, and operation risk, and, and to uh, invest investment in, in system and procedure and, and free uh, product development. If we could turn to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the key strategic issues. Um, during the course of the past two years, when we try to develop our RMB strategy, uh, we have come across a number of, of issues uh, that we, we debate long and hard in, internally. For example, in terms of the timing, should we do it now or should we do it later? I think it goes without saying that the approach taken by the Chinese government is to allow the development of the offshore RMB market independent of the onshore market. Typically, taking a one-step at a time approach, and then hopefully sometime down the line, the two, i.e. the offshore and the, off, and the onshore market will converge, and after going through, after the onshore market, having gone through a series of restructuring. So it is going to be uh, a long and a gradual process. Um, and we at HSBC, uh, and possibly uh, some other financial institutions in, in Hong Kong in particular, have taken the view that you, we should be there now rather than later. Again, I think it varies from institution to institution depending on, on where they are and, and, and their own customer base. The second issue is this RMB business, whether it is substitution or incremental. I think um, in, in wind uh, hit map uh, trade finance that might be considered more a substitution, i.e., um, the, the current trade flow instead of being financed in, in US dollars or being denominated in US dollars will just be re denominated in, in RMB. My counter argument to that is 
during the course of RMB internationalization, depending on the different timing, different products, it is going to be a bit of a zigzagging, i.e. the same product during a different stage of the development might be incremental, might be substitutional, depends on uh, the market conditions. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, even if it is substitutional business, I think it is still incumbent on the banks concerned to, to upkeep their, their, their position and, and as a result, uh, just as important to, to get involved in the RMB business uh, to protect the, the existing market share, the existing market position. If it is incremental business, so, so much the better. The next item that we, we have to consider is the profitability of, of the RMB business. I think, in all honesty, we have to manage each other's expectation that probably in some, in some product classes, in some business uh, in Hong Kong, the, the RMB business is more profitable than, than, than the other. Um, and as a result, I think we need to strike a, a right balance between business volume, market share, and return. Now, as a result, we have to take a pragmatic approach, and uh, my, my word of advice is prime for growth, but priced to the market. Take a sensible approach here. Last but not the least is the internal coordination. Um, again, I think it is important to have the, the, all the necessary internal buy-in from various customer groups and the product groups so that we all work together instead of the typical mentality of you no know, net, net pocket, right pocket, uh, especially during the initial stage of, of the RMB internationalization, as I said earlier on, not all the products, not every single one of the products uh, could be very profitable, but if banks make the decision that they need to be involved in that business, uh, they have to look at the, the all-in return to the bank instead of to a specific product group or, or customer group per se. And as a result, uh, take the case of HSBC, uh, we also have to work across geographies using Hong Kong as the center of excellence to hopefully replicate some of the products from Hong Kong to other places such as Singapore and, and, and London. Uh, I think the, the final conclusion is uh, China's economic footprint is too big to, uh, to ignore. RMB internationalization has tremendous opportunities. Again, it's far too important to ignore. In terms of how one should strategize itself, really depends on one's own business model, uh, where they are located, and what kind of customers they are serving. Uh, and then we just have to take a sensible and a pragmatic approach in terms of how much we want to invest uh, in, in this business. Um, that's all I have to say. Back to you, Peter. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Thomas. That was uh, good. And we now have about 10 minutes left for a question and answer. Uh, we did have a couple of questions come in, so I think uh, we do need to make it pretty quick. Um, I'd like to actually lead off with uh, something that's not been mentioned. I mean, we've uh, been talking about the RMB. Um, we've been looking at perhaps um, short-term strategies, medium-term strategies, long-term strategies. I guess the long-term strategy would be that you know, the RMB could become um, you know, a serious international currency to rival the dollar. Um, what's not been mentioned, I guess, is the future of the Hong Kong dollar. Um, I guess looking at a long-term view, um, I do wonder what the role of the, wrong, the Hong Kong dollar is if one day the renminbi is a global currency to rival the, the U.S. dollar. Um, do any of you guys have any thoughts about that? Um, of course, there's a lot of sentimental value to the Hong Kong dollar and a lot of existing business, but what is the, the long-term view? Um, perhaps, uh, uh, Thomas, could you, could you give us your thoughts, and, and Michael as well, since you're uh, both with um, banks that have large operations in Hong Kong? Okay, I, I give my view first. Um, first of all, I think it is probably a long time before we need to consider this, uh, this option, whether Hong Kong dollars should be packed or should be linked to, to RMB for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, I, I think R in order for, for Hong Kong dollars to, to be repacked to, to RMB, RMB got to be fully convertible. It got to be uh, used as a reserve currency and there got to be enough RMB assets available in the market. And, and, and that market got to have the depth and, and the breadth. 
and and then uh, another consideration is whether at that time Hong Kong Hong Kong's economy is in complete sync with, with China. Probably by then it should be, uh, given the increased uh, economic integration between Hong Kong and and China. But 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 frankly speaking, right now I think it is probably premature to speculate in terms of the timing and in terms of whether that that is this repacking is going to happen uh, or, or not because right now. Uh, R&D is at this initial stage of development. Uh, it really is a long way away from uh, from 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 any Hong Kong, from the Hong Kong government having to make that kind of decision. Um, okay, thanks, Thomas. Maybe in the interest of time, we'll we'll get into the questions that have come in from uh, from the the, the participants. Um, could, could I see the first? Question? Uh, the first question is, what is the outlook of the renminbi in light of the recent U.S. pressure on the Chinese government to revalue the CNY? Uh, perhaps, um, I guess, uh, Michael, would you have a view on that, perhaps? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I get asked this question quite regularly, um, Peter, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a very valid question and, and very good question. I, I think the, the, way I tend, the way I respond to this, and, and it's to think about what the what the point here is and and when i when we talk to our corporate clients around renminbi and and whether it's important to them it's actually not about depreciation or appreciation the question is about control and it's about um it's 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 about having a choice and and the renminbi internationalization and the renminbi cross border trade settlement scheme is effectively offering corporates a choice as to who's going to manage that exchange risk it doesn't matter that there will always be an exchange risk. If you have operations in China and you're selling to the U.S. or you're buying from China to sell into the U.S., you, you're going to have you're going to have exchange risk. The question is who manages it, and I think that's that's where the the, the core of the question needs to be answered. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, that was very good. Um, let's move to the to the second question um, very quickly. Uh, which products and transactions are eligible to be transacted in CNH vis-à-vis -vis CNY? Uh, Thomas, Thomas you want to take this one? Uh, Thomas, uh, could you uh, take the question, which products or transactions are eligible to be transacted in CNH vis-à-vis -vis CNY? So I suppose this is a uh, unique to the CNH that cannot be done in the um, CNY. Right. Um, not normally, all the loan trade related transactions would have to be transacted in, in CNH. For example, investment in, in life insurance products, invest, investment in, in offshore RMB bond, um, uh, only in case if, if there's a cross-border trade involved then uh, it, those, those trade will, will be eligible for, for the onshore CNY rate. Otherwise, everything else um, should, should be priced at uh, CNH. Yeah, yeah, Peter, it's important to realize that CNH is not a currency. Okay? The currency is CNY. And all that CNH means is that it's the deliverable CNY currency in Hong Kong. And the, the rules are pretty clear on this. It, effectively, you can do anything. On, if, if the renminbi is sitting in Hong Kong, you can use it as if you would use any other currency. If you're moving the renminbi cross-border, either receiving renminbi from China or sending renminbi to China, then it has to be an, an underlying genuine cross-border trade transaction. And that, that attracts, or potentially can attract the onshore rate, which may or may not be better in terms of um, depending on which side of the uh, transaction the client is sitting on. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Thomas and Michael, for uh, for explaining that. I mean, it was a question that had come in from uh, from a participant who wanted to understand that a bit more clearly. The third question is, in a way, I guess, linked as well to the point that you just brought up, Michael. Uh, I understand that there are certain limitations to transferring CNY to and from mainland China. Can you please elaborate on this issue? I think, Michael, uh, you were talking in your first part about how this is opening up, but maybe could you sort of define this? Uh, what can can be done? Yeah, there's a couple of things to be aware of here. The first thing is it has to be genuine trade, and that can be genuine goods trade or genuine service trade. Um, the the participant in China currently needs to be registered, and there's this sort of terminology called the mainland designated enterprise. So they need to be kind of on a register, uh, registered with a PBOC, uh, so that they can actually um, uh, um, uh, sort of be a um, uh, sort of ex export from 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 China. Um, and pay and and um, and receive and, and sort of pay and receive renminbi. 
Um, for those who are um, uh, paying renminbi out of China, they have to be on another list called the, if they're not an MDE already, they can register with the PBOC as a qualified non-MDE. And it really comes down to the export verification process, which is quite complex in China. Um, but, but effectively, uh, the, the, the company in China has to be registered on the PBOC system in order to send or receive renminbi. And your bank in China will be able to help you um, with, with access to that information. I hope okay, I was thank clear. You, yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, okay, we have a final question, um, and I think it's a bit complex. Uh, what are your views of the current restrictions imposed by the HKMA, uh, and this is a reference to HKMA survey results to some of the AIs, uh, which has been re released recently. Um, that's probably not a question for Wim either. So, um, Thomas or um, Michael, uh, do you have a view on this? Uh, I'm not sure if if um, he, um, this has been referred at um, the HKMA regulations on tapping the, the Bank of China's Hong Kong um, exchange conversion window. If, if, this, is, if this is the, the, the intent of the question, then my, my personal view is, yes, it, it is somewhat complicated. For example, uh, um, the, 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 the customers will have to provide the banks with all the necessary supporting documents. And as you can imagine, for multinational companies doing cross-border trade, uh, they, they have been trying their best to uh, to automate uh, the system on a paper nuts basis so that to ask them to refer to to a paper based approach is is obviously problematic problematic for the customers who want to settle the trade with china uh, in r m b problematic to 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 banks in Hong Kong who have to 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 check and 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 ask to who has to ask and ask for supporting document and check and make sure that those supporting documents uh, are, are genuine and related to the underlying transaction. And, and, and on top of that, there is the three months rule, i.e. Um, the, the trade in terms of looking out the trade in, trade out position, um, the RMB received across the border uh, can be uh, can only be treated as trade related if it, it doesn't sit in the account for longer than three months. If it sits in the account longer than three months period, it doesn't it doesn't get counted as trade related as such. So effectively, if you if if, if a bank say for example HSBC have thousands and thousands of transactions on a monthly basis, some get converted in on, on day one, some some of that got converted on you no know, uh, a month later. It, it makes the whole tracking. Uh, very, very difficult. So um, I, I think this is something that um, both, uh, I mean, from my personal point of view, uh, I would hope, uh, uh, given time, uh, HKMA might be willing to to, review, to revisit all, all these regulatory requirements to make uh, the life a bit easier for banks and for the customers who want to do more trade in RMB. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, I think uh, I'd like to maybe take a uh, take a final question uh, and to maybe go back to the, the international element of uh, the renminbi uh, conversation that we're having right now and maybe to ask Wim, um, one of the things that fascinated me about uh, your presentation, Wim, was when you mentioned the 8% that is truly offshore, um, meaning those markets that uh, trade renminbi with each other that are, you know, where there's one leg is neither Hong Kong nor China. Um, in terms, and this is probably the marker of uh, a, a, a currency that is truly internationalized where it's not... Um, involving any of the main uh, issuing countries. So uh, could you maybe give us your view on on where you see this um, sort of uh, evolving, uh, perhaps also in context of other currencies that are traded between, I guess, not the, you know, the non-issued um, country? Wim? Yeah, sure, uh, Peter. Uh, well, I think two, two interesting uh, additional uh, facts here in terms of data to subscribe uh, to, to your question. Um, when we look at the number of financial institutions doing business with China over the SWIFT network, it's around 3,200, uh, let's say, banks who are doing business with China in payments across currencies from over 170 countries. When we look at the number of banks doing business with China and Hong Kong and RMB, it is since September over 1,000 financial institutions. So quite um, an interesting uh, de development in terms of size of number of institutions now doing business 
in uh, Renminbi. However, it is still roughly only 30% of banks that are doing business with China in, 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 in uh, across currencies. So there is still a tremendous growth opportunity. Uh, and, and I think um, I think that is what, what Michael and, and Thomas also were, I think, alluding to is that there is in Hong Kong for sure and in Singapore and in London, uh, tremendous uh, activity. Uh, now we see an increasing number of banks being ready and starting to transact in RMB uh, transactions. And I think over time that will just um, that will just add to the volume. So um, we, I think we will see going forward an increasing number of, um, of RMB transactions with Hong Kong and China. Like for Russia, it's over 54% is with uh, payments with Russia are in ruble in its, in its own currency. With China, uh, we only see like uh, overall 10% or so is denominated in, uh, in RMB. So there's, there's still uh, a very big growth opportunity there. Okay, thank you very much, Wim. Uh, thank you also, uh, Michael and Thomas. Uh, we actually still have questions coming in, but I'm afraid we've run out of time for our presentation. We're not able to, to reach them. Uh, it's quite clear uh, that the renminbi is, is a fascinating topic uh, that we certainly need to, to address uh, again uh, regularly to update uh, uh, the participants who are interested in learning more. Uh, we will be conducting these types of uh, teleconsultations uh, frequently in the future on the renminbi as well as other topics, but of course the renminbi uh, needs constant exploring as, as it evolves. Um, so we do want to thank uh, our, our speakers and panelists as well as the participants who've, who've uh, joined in, especially those who offered questions. Um, uh, our apologies to those questions that we didn't get uh, some time for. Um, I'd like to maybe just give a, a very, very brief um, summary of, of some of the points that were mentioned, of course. Um, Michael brought up uh, the Li Keqiang's um, uh, very overt sort of um, uh, support from Beijing of Hong Kong and the renminbi and the renminbi internationalization uh, programs that are that are being conducted there. Um, he's also, of course, mentioned the challenges brought up between having two types of renminbi. Um, certainly, there's only one official renminbi, but there's a CNH uh, that uh, indicates Hong Kong activity to sort of uh, counteract uh, the true CNY. Uh, Wim, of course, um, took us through uh, the various uh, ways of looking at uh, renminbi traffic that SWIFT reports, um, including, of course, the, the SWIFT corridors. It's, uh, the renminbi is um, basically low, uh, ranking as a world currency relative to its importance as an economy. Um, the trade settlement um, story, of course, as well as the um, the the heat map that he offered where he's laid out which um, which businesses would be hot in renminbi and which ones are simply being re-denominated, uh, where there's a, sort of a, um, a business as usual approach to the conversion to this new currency. And then of course there's the real opportunities being provided in FX and securities. Um, he also brought up the 8% the um, truly offshore renminbi and, and in the Q&A elaborated on where that might be going uh, perhaps uh, also elaborating on SWIFT's experience with other currencies and the way that they are used, uh, both uh, uh, domestically and, and globally. Uh, Thomas, uh, again, um, mentioned uh, Li Keqiang and uh, went through as well some of the thinking that takes place at a bank like HSBC where it uh, uh, debates how it would approach this type of a development uh, and, of course, the, the, the level-headed type of thinking that goes into uh, considerations about when to do it, um, how much to, to, uh, to allocate to um, a new business like that, uh, an analysis of the types of profitability as well as um, operational issues like internal coordination. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants, of course, and the, and the, um, and the speakers as well for uh, for joining in today, and this ends the session. Thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, do keep a lookout for uh, a reminder email about uh, where to find the recording of today's presentation. Uh